Views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. It's always time for the dead to shine in Hollywood. The legendary Dearly Departed Tours has stepped up their ghostly game by offering the Hollywood Ghosts and Legends Walking Tour. Dearly Departed has long been an orb of hope in the paranormal world, having been featured on television's Haunted History and Haunted Collector. Their terrible tales have been made infamous in Marla Brooks' The Ghosts of Hollywood books. The new Ghosts and Legends Tour is a 10-block, 70-minute dusk time stroll down the boulevard of broken dreams. You'll be guided through the golden age of Hollywood and see where the unearthly Bela Lugosi, Lon Chaney, and the calamitous Black Dahlia are still said to linger. You'll see Hollywood's gothic hotels, legendary theaters, and restaurants, never forgetting their permanent occupants. No stranger to investigations, Dearly Departed Tours has first-hand knowledge of some of these hauntings. For details of the Hollywood Ghosts and Legends walking tour, find Dearly Departed Tours on Facebook, DearlyDepartedTours.com, or call 1-855-600-DEAD. Everybody and welcome once again to Stirring the Cauldron here on the Para X Radio Network. Tonight's opening music was called Celebration. It's a medieval dance and it's appropriate because the focus of the show tonight is a medieval figure, King Arthur, the legendary British leader who, according to medieval histories and romances, led the defense of Britain against Saxon invaders in the late 5th and 6th centuries. And author Graham Phillips is back to talk about his new book, the Lost Tomb of King Arthur, The Search for Camelot and the Isle of Avalon. Now, Graham is former radio journalist and BBC broadcaster, a historical investigator, and author of 13 books, including The Templars of the Ark of the Covenant, The Chalice of Magdalene, and Merlin and the Discovery of Avalon in, New, in the New World, which we talked about the last time he was here. And that was such a good show. I was really glad the King Arthur book was close to being published at that time, so he could come back. <laughs> Graham, welcome back, and once again, I appreciate you staying up into the wee hours to do a live show. I'm absolutely loving it. If I snore halfway through, please forgive me. Uh, it's okay. We'll do a little wakey-wakey, you know, like maybe Sarge has this, this horn that makes a really loud noise or something, and we could we could kind of wake you up that way. It's like two um, o'clock in the morning here, but um, at least it's <laughs> summertime. <laughs> well, okay. I didn't know that summer was very summery in England anyway, but I guess you do have some, some of the time that it's kind of warm and comfy, right? It, well, sometimes it doesn't rain. That's summer for us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I like that. That's perfect. Uh, now, when I just mentioned that you were a historical researcher, that's kind of a bit of an understatement, I think, because your research just doesn't take weeks or months or even years at times. I mean, it's 
thorough enough that sometimes it takes decades. And the back cover blurb of the King Arthur book cites that this book is the culmination of 25 years of research, of translations, of primary source material. Now, you know, that's a quarter of a century. And after all that time, um, you know, it's finally, you would think that finally coming to the end of all that is a relief. Or perhaps, you know, for someone who is a researcher, maybe you think that there's still more that you have to do or that you left out. Um, what happens when you finish a book like this? <laughs> Start another one. Now, um, <laughs> the, good, the good thing about it is that the kind of research I do can run parallel. It's not as if I've actually spent 25 years day and night just doing King Arthur. I mean, I might concentrate on King Arthur for a couple of weeks, couple of months, and then I'll have reached a dead end. It's as far as I've managed to go in that particular area of research. And so then I'll be working on another book about some other subject and the same thing might happen there. And I'll, I'll move between them. And it just so happens that 25 years on and off has now reached its um, its crescendo, so to speak, with the book out. And I'm very pleased it is out because if I was to die tomorrow, at least all this research on King Arthur has been published. <laughs> well, that's a good way to look at it. Then you, like, then, okay, you can con then you can contact me on one of your, um, uh, whatever it is you do with your tours. You can come around to see my house with, and say, that's where Graham Phillips lived. And yeah, that's, my fr that's, that's right. My friend's dearly departed tour. Yes. Um, uh, that's right. Yes. That. Yes. Well, he lived in England for quite a while and did some over there as well. So, um, yeah, we we could probably talk him into doing that for you. Mm hmm. The, the Graham Phillips Trail. Yes, and, and, and it's a long, long, hard trail for sure. Um, but, okay, so what was the genesis of this book? Um, like, where did the quest begin? Was it specifically to find King Arthur's tomb or to prove that he was a real person? Um, did you start out that maybe if you found Avalon and Camelot, then you'd find the tomb? Or, or how did it all get put together? Well, it started off in the early uh, 1990s, and it began really as I w what I was doing was doing research to, I did the other book about uh, Merlin that I mentioned before, and I was doing research into the story of Merlin, uh, and I thought, well, okay, this, the Merlin figure seems to have been real. Mm-hmm at least based on a real historical figure that actually did real things. And I thought, well, maybe King Arthur was too. And it just started off, I'll just generally look into it. And in fact, to start off with, at the very beginning of all this, even before Merlin, my original thinking was that, nah, there is no King Arthur. I mean, people had said, oh, there must be a figure behind this myth. But the story of King Arthur as written about in the Middle Ages was so fanciful damsels in distress, dragons, magic swords, ladies of the lake and all this sort of thing. I just thought, well, <laughs> there's no possibility there's anything behind this. So it started off as a kind of, well, I'll kind of disprove it once and for all, perhaps write a few uh, articles about it, and that'll be the end of that. So it didn't start me looking for Arthur. It started with me sort of trying to prove he didn't exist, really. Mm -hmm. Which is the right way to go about it, if you want to be honest. Um better to try and disprove something before you try to prove it without disproving it. Absolutely. That makes sense, yeah. I mean, the most, the, what I found fascinating, I mean, if it, to just summarize the, the, the legend for, for those who don't, you know, may not remember the whole thing, mm -hmm. the story as it was written about in the Middle Ages has got Arthur, who is brought up in secret, and a sword appears in a stone and whoever can pull the sword from the stone becomes the king. Now, the young Arthur does this and everybody is completely flummoxed by it and he's the only one who can do it, so they make him king as a young man. Mm -hmm. uh, he grows up, he founds the Knights of the Round Table and at Britain's most magnificent city by the name of Camelot, he establishes court. He then um, eventually, he after ruling over his land for many years, there's a rebellion led by his treacherous nephew, Modred, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And when Modred and Arthur are on the field of battle, they both inflict a mortal wound upon each other. And as Arthur lies dying, he asks his knight to take his sword and throw it into a nearby lake. And when it, his sword, Excalibur, is thrown into the lake, the arm of this mysterious nymph-like creature called the Lady of the Lake grabs the weapon and takes it down into the water to be lost forever to mortal man. And then when the knight returns to where Arthur lies dying, he finds that he's being taken on a barge across the lake to an island in the middle called Avalon, where he is then laid to rest. And the, 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 the secret is that nobody knows to this day where Arthur was finally buried. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the story. And, and you look at it, and it, it, it doesn't sound very realistic. So my next thing really was to find out, well, did somebody just make it up and when? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's interesting because there's a lot of things in the book that make you kind of stop and sh- scratch your head for a minute because you hadn't thought of that before, you know? I mean, everybody knows the Arthurian romances, the legends, and, well, not everybody, but a lot of most people. And they're like fairy tales, but but to go ahead and kind of explain all of this, I mean... You know, in the end, your research in this book provides kind of the necessary evidence that shows that King Arthur was, in fact, a real living person and not a myth, and that Camelot was actually a real place, and that Excalibur was a real sword. And that and that in and of itself is kind of like, whoa, that's head-scratching. Well, the stories that are told about King Arthur outlined as I just did then, were many dozens, hundreds of stories written throughout the Middle Ages from a, from about uh, 1130 onwards, mm-hmm. um, which they're all, they're all pretty fanciful. But what I found fairly early on was that much earlier texts than these, for example, a work written by a monk by the name of Nennius, who lived around about 830, which mm-hmm. is like 300 years before the first of these Arthurian romances, as they know, were written. He writes in a book called The History of Britain. He was, he was writing in Latin, which the actual book was called The Historia Britonum. It still survives in the British Library in London. And there, amongst other historical matters in Britain, he tells us that King Arthur was a historical figure. In other words, he records Arthur as an historical leader who united the warring British factions around the year 500 to repel the invading Anglo-Saxons who were arriving from Germany. to, mm-hmm. And he united the native Celtic Britons. And for a number of years, he successfully held the Saxons at bay, even pushed them almost back out of the country. But he talks about him in a completely matter-of-fact sort of way. He doesn't have any flights of fancy. There's no mystical maidens in distress and all this sort of thing. And this guy is writing about Arthur as an historical figure. And this was 300 years before the first of these sort of fanciful Arthurian stories are written. So it really seemed like there was a place for Arthur in history as a genuine figure. Mm Mm-hmm. And and because you always think that people make things up, but everything is based. A lot of fictional characters are based on real people. Maybe very little based, but somehow based on them. And but you know the Arthurian stuff is so wonderful. And 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 um, as I'm reading in the book, you know, you you talk about the Round Table, you know, and that that gets into a whole thing, just that in of itself. But. The legend of King Arthur is, what, over a thousand years old. Um, And I think probably because of all the fiction that's been written over the years, um, the person that was behind the myths was probably completely discarded historically, wouldn't you think? Well, he certainly evolved into what became the the myths of the Middle Ages. I mean, first of all, you've got to appreciate the period in which the historical Arthur is said to have lived. Now, the, the, the fictional tale says he lives around 500 AD. This earlier writing by, by this monk Nennius says he lives around 500 AD. 
Now, the period that we normally associate with King Arthur with is a period of knights in shining armour and fighting with broadswords, living in Gothic castles. Well, these mm -hmm. weren't built until sort of the, the 1100s and after that, mm -hmm. whereas the real Arthur is many hundreds of years earlier. Mm -hmm. Now, an historical figure of Arthur, if he lived 500, would have been more of a Roman-style figure because the Romans had ruled Britain for centuries. The Roman Empire collapsed in the 400s and the Romans left Britain. But people still wore Roman-style armour and fought with shorter Roman-style swords. And they didn't live in... The fortifications weren't huge Gothic castles, but wooden stockades um, and fortifications which were more Roman-style. So for a start, you've got a different kind of setting. The reason, incidentally, why in the Middle Ages they started to portray Arthur in that way with, you know, in their own historical context was because mm -hmm. they, they had no idea what this figure would have looked like. They didn't know what people looked like or how they dressed or how they lived hundreds of years earlier. It took historians of later centuries to work that out. But the thing is that at the time Arthur lived, Britain was in a state of anarchy. The Romans had left. It's just as if, imagine what would happen now to any civilised country if suddenly all the army, all the police disappeared overnight. You'd mm -hmm. have gang warfare. Well, this is pretty much what happened in Britain. The Roman administration had gone, and instead what you have is Britain has divided up into a lot of tribal kingdoms. And these tribal kingdoms were often fighting each other so into this war-torn, civil strife country came an invader such as the Anglo-Saxons and caused even more trouble. Now, mm -hmm. the Arthur we're told about by Nennius is said to be the person who for a short while managed to unite these warring separate kingdoms into an overall fighting force and managed to defeat the Saxons. And for a period of 20 or 30 years of Arthur's reign, the country enjoyed a period of great prosperity. But once he died, the Anglo-Saxons were on the move again and the country quickly fell apart. And it's against this background that we've got to really see what an historical figure of Arthur would look like. And so if we're looking for medieval legends such as the Round Table, as you mentioned, you've got to say, well, would that would they have had round tables of the sort we associate <laughs> with Arthur at the time that Arthur lived? And the answer is no. But in case of the Round Table, the Celtic warriors of Britain of that period are known to have, when they met together, when the various chieftains met, they sat in a circle around a cauldron. And from that cauldron, they would share a meal or share drink to prove that they went out to poison each other. And they sat in a circle so it would be that nobody could sit at the head of it. So mm -hmm. they were all equals. And it's mm -hmm. that that I believe later became medievalized as the round table as we know it. Ah, I like that. So Is you've got a cauldron in there, you see? Well, yes. I mean, how could you not like a cauldron? I mean, that, that, that's me on a plate. Uh, <laughs> now, let's talk about who you believe the mythic King Arthur really was. And while I do know the answer to the question from reading your book, I wouldn't even begin to try and pronounce his name correctly because it looks like a bit of a tongue twister. So I'm going to leave that to you and to tell us about the man and how all the puzzle pieces fit together to come to the conclusion that King Arthur... Um, had um, a real live counterpart? Well, it starts really with the fact that so many historians had looked for an historical figure, such as mentioned by this monk, Nennius, mm -hmm. but nobody had ever found anything with the name Arthur written on it from the period in question. Mm -hmm. No tombstones, no inscriptions or writings. But one thing you have to remember is that during this turbulent time after the collapse of the Roman Empire, which we know as the Dark Ages, very few records were kept by anyone. Um, one of the things that many people forget is that there was, uh, they think, well, the Romans go, you know, what people can still write, well, what are they going to write on? 
The manufacture of paper and other writing materials was a kind of industry in Roman times. Once that had all collapsed, people were having to write on parchment, in other words, the skin of animals. They had to be prepared in a certain way, so did inks. And the only pe way that the only people who actually were were trained in reading and writing were some monks in monasteries so very few people were actually writing anything let alone the possibility of it surviving through these turbulent you know times mm -hmm. so first of all people say well we you know we've looked for an author and we, we we've never found anything with him written with his name written on it mm -hmm. so i thought okay few records survive a few do but if i can't use what's in the records to try and isolate who this Arthur is that Nennius is talking about, then perhaps I can use archaeology. Now, this is why it's taken over 25 years to do all this, because mm -hmm. archaeology is slow and laborious, and you've got to wait mm -hmm. for them to investigate one site, then another. But finally, a picture came together of what Britain was actually like during the period Arthur is said to have lived. Mm -hmm. And... In, uh, so I thought, is it possible to find Arthur's capital firstly? In other words, he's said to have ruled from this most magnificent city in the country called Camelot. If I can find that, maybe I can start to try and figure out who this Arthur was. Well, the problem with the name Camelot, just looking for somewhere called that, firstly, nothing survives with that name. But mm -hmm. secondly, that was actually made up in the Middle Ages it was a name that was invented by a French uh, poet to rhyme with the name Lancelot. <laughs> but but, it, uh, yeah, but it's, it is weird, but that's exactly how it came about. Uh -huh. But even though the name was made up, there were earlier references and earlier tales about King Arthur ruling from this magnificent city, although it, it's, it, it's not named. In other words, it seems to have been forgotten over the centuries. So mm -hmm. I said, okay, what it might not have been called Camelot, but what was the most powerful city around 500 AD? Now, London, for example, which had been the capital during Roman times, had been overrun by the Anglo-Saxons. So it's no longer that city. And over the, over the years, archaeology has determined that it was a Roman city called Viriconium, mm -hmm. which is smack bang in the middle of Britain, basically. Uh, in a county called Shro Shropshire. And this was a Roman city. It was one of the largest at the end of the Roman Empire, but then became the capital of dark, early Dark Age Britain. And archaeology that has been conducted there over the years has shown that around 500 AD, this city, rather than being abandoned like many other Roman cities were, were for more defensible hilltop fortifications was completely refortified and rebuilt and more than that right at the center of this city there was a a palace built a roman style manor building an important residence for somebody of extreme high status and the archaeologists say it seems to have been the 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 the, the seat of the person who united the Britons against the Anglo-Saxons at the period Arthur is said to have done this. And the magnificent thing about this city, which I began to think that's a good candidate for the historical Camelot, is that its ruins still survive in open countryside, walls, foundation stones. You can wander around it, the site's open to the public. And there's even a museum, a small museum on the site displaying the various finds that have been made there. So this place, Viraconium, in the centre of England, mm -hmm. was what I thought was going to have been the historical Camelot, and it was there I decided to direct my investigations. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there were people that did believe that King Arthur was a real person and, and wanted others to, and, and perhaps for a good reason, because of what transpired, for example, at Glastonbury Abbey back in 1191. That was one indication. Um, and basically, and they, they said that they dug up um, a tomb. They found a tomb next to the Lady Chapel. And uh, there were two skeletons, or skeletons, corpses in there, and they decided that it was King Arthur's tomb, and he and Guinevere were in there. And so, 
you know, that I think what, if I'm not mistaken, the whole thing was kind of a hoax because they were trying to rebuild the monastery and that was kind of bringing in sort of the tourist trade and uh, helping them, you know, throwing a few quid here and there so they could get the the monastery uh, rebuilt, the abbey rebuilt. Is that kind that's of That's absolutely right. Yes, that's what's happening in the late 1100s. Absolutely right. The monks claim to have found these bones and when they were digging around in the, in the ruins of the abbey, which had just been gutted by fire. But the reason why we can now say for fairly, fairly certain that it was a fake is because they claim to have found a cross with it, a lead cross inscribed mm-hmm. with the, the words, here lies the renowned King Arthur in the Isle of Avalon. Well, mm-hmm. if you imagine somebody, for example, like a, a real king that we know about, like Richard III, if you found Richard III's grave, which they have done recently... Under the parking ex- lot, yes. Under the parking lot <laughs> in yeah. Leicester in England. Yeah. They, if somebody had found a cross buried with it saying, here lies the famous Richard III in mm. Leicester, you would rather doubt it because, well, why, <laughs> A, why tell them where it is? And B, why say he's famous? Everybody knows it. The whole thing just smelt of a hoax. Of mm-hmm. course, the cross and the bones are no longer available for us to examine today. But a lot of people still hold on, those who believe there was a real Arthur, still hold on to the possibility that he, his Camelot was somewhere near Glastonbury, which is in the southwest of England. Mm-hmm. So I've come along and said, right, I'm looking in a completely different place. And I, if there is a real Arthur, he's going to be at this historical capital of Britain, Viriconium, right in the centre of England. So I needed to find out who ruled that place around 500 AD. And luckily enough, records do survive in the British Library again. We've got a series of, uh, of, of, of documents called genealogies, Dark Age genealogies, which are basically family trees of the different kingdoms during the period after the Romans left. And we can work out from these that the person who exactly the person who ruled from Viriconium was at the time. I'm thinking, you know, this is when Arthur must have been active. At first, I was absolutely devastated because his name is revealed not as Arthur, but as Owen, a man called. And you said before you couldn't pronounce the second mm-hmm. name. It's actually pronounced Thanguin. <laughs> Owen Thanguin. Mm-kay. But oh, this, but it's not, it's not Arthur, and I'm right, thinking, right. oh, I have spent all this time, and but at first I thought, well, at least I found the figure perhaps upon whom the Arthurian legend was based. Mm-hmm. I'll console myself with that until mm-hmm. I read the writings of another monk, one of the very few writings to survive from the lifetime of the period Arthur lived, was by mm-hmm. another monk called Gildas. And he writes about the king of Paris. Uh, at the, uh, uh, P- Paris is the kingdom around Viriconium. The, he writes about the man who ruled from Viriconium at, uh, at 500 AD. But he doesn't just refer to him as Owen. He refers to him by his title. Now, Celtic warriors of this period were often given or adopted battle names of animals that in mm-hmm. some way represented their prowess, if you were cunning, the fox, if you were far-sighted, the eagle, and so forth. And he refers, he's writing in Latin, incidentally, he refers to the man who ruled Viraconium in 500 AD as Ursus, which means the bear. So -hmm. this is his battle name, his title. But what's really interesting, if you translate the word bear back into Brythonic, which was the language spoken in Britain at the time, the word for a bear was Arth, A-R-T-H, which actually still survives in modern-day Welsh, which derived from Brythonic. Mm-hmm. So the fa- so you've, then I thought, wow, I'm onto something here. Arthur is said <laughs> to have ruled Britain around 500 AD from the most powerful city in the country. Archaeology has shown that the most powerful city in the country at that time was Viraconian, and the man who ruled for it was actually known as Arth, that could easily have developed into Arthur over the years. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that is pretty, convi- you know, pretty convincing evidence that I'd found an historical figure who fitted the bill. And perhaps the reason why 
he'd become so forgotten over history is he'd gone down under history under his title rather than his real name. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that wouldn't be the first time. I mean, everyone's heard of Genghis Khan, established the Mongol Empire, the largest empire the world had ever known. Mm -hmm. But Genghis Khan isn't his real name. That simply is his title, meaning universal ruler. Genghis Khan's real name was Timurjan. So Mm -hmm. the same sort of thing seems to have happened with Arthur. In other words, the man who united the Britons and started the legend went down under history as his title. Mm-hmm. That makes good sense, doesn't it? Now, I mean, <laughs> you know, if you in it's not something you were, yeah, you wouldn't come up with it right off the bat. But yeah, um, I've got a question from the chat room going back to um, the Arthurian tales. Um, she says, it always seemed to me that the Arthurian tales were of the transition of pagan England to Christian England. Um, Does your guest think a lot of those tales were more Christian-based or more pagan-based? That's an extremely good question and something I looked into quite a lot in the book. Mm -hmm. Um, The end of the Roman Empire, by the time the Roman Empire was in its last century, it was a Christian empire. The Romans had, had adopted Christianity and founded the Roman Catholic Church. But it wasn't a kind of compulsory thing. Uh, there was a lot. There was a, a, there were, some people were pagans and some people were Christians, and they lived, you know, pretty much side by side like that. And mm-hmm. the same was happening in Britain at the actual time Arthur is said to have lived. Uh, and in fact, you've got a kind of hybrid sort of religion developing where people are sometimes worshiping in old gods and sometimes uh, doing ceremonial things that to honor the old gods but at the same time they're practicing christianity in a kind of partially but what happens by the middle so so the original legends that begin um are legends that uh, or stories that are kind of pagan with a bit of christianity thrown in but then by the middle ages when these stories are completely rewritten for a medieval audience they're totally christianized I mean, a good example for this is the Holy Grail. Many, mm-hmm. There are many aspects of the Holy, Holy Grail story, and it's a very complicated thing in its own right. I've written an entire book about that. But one <laughs> type of Grail story that was written about in the very earliest Arthurian stories has the Grail as a cauldron. There you go. You've got your cauldron again. There we go. <laughs> it's, a mag- it's a magic cauldron that is said to, if you drink from it, you can uh, attain eternal life. Well, and isn't that like Caradwin's cauldron? Ca- that's exactly what it is, okay. precisely. All it right. is indeed Caradwin's cauldron. Yeah. But then, of course, by the Middle Ages, when it's when the when the when when Europe is ex- extremely Christian, then they they don't like this idea of a, 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 a pagan cauldron. So they turn the, the, many of the stories about the search for this cauldron into a search for the cup that Jesus had. In other words, the Holy Grail, as we now know it, mm-hmm. uh, or at least one of the aspects of the Holy Grail story. So mm-hmm. that's very much how things developed. But mm-hmm. it, there's there's one particular story that's that's we're told that the in, in in the Arthurian tales of the Middle Ages, which is about the Lady of the Lake, the sword being thrown to the Lady of the Lake. Now that sounds completely over the top. It really does sound like a made up fairy tale. But this can be possibly traced back to genuine pagan religious events that took place in the early Dark Ages. For example, when a high-status individual such as a king was dying or had died during their funeral, their sword was often thrown into a sacred pool or lake as an offering to a water goddess. Mm -hmm. Now, this could very well have developed into the idea of when Arthur lies dying, his sword is thrown to this strange nymph-like creature, the Lady of the Lake. But what I, what one thing that absolutely proves that one derived from the other, in my mind, is that the records show that the Celtic water goddess that these swords were thrown to was called Viviana. And the name of the Lady of the Lake in the earliest stories in the Middle Ages is Vivian. Mm. So in uh, answer to, to, to what your uh, listener has said, yes, the, there's a lot of mix-up between Christianity and paganism, and the very period that when one is taking over from the other is when Arthur is said to have lived. Mm-hmm. Yep. 
I like that. Um, and, and speaking of the sword, um, you know, I want to discuss how you found the final resting place of, of the sword, Excalibur, um, and the lake in the English countryside where it was found. I mean, what led you to that specific location? And it was one of those things where you you actually got specialist divers and marine archaeologists to go down. Um, so what led you there and what did you find and what were your conclusions when it was found? Well, what it what happened was that I wanted to try and if having established in my mind anyway that this man Owen was in fact the real King Arthur who ruled from Viraconium, mm -hmm. I decided next this is when the search for the tomb comes in. Where would he have been buried? Do we know where this guy's buried? Mm -hmm. There may not be any surviving references to where exactly Arthur was buried apart from the only references the only thing we can go on from the from the legends of Arthur is that he was buried on an island in the middle of a lake. Now, there are a number of Avalons that come into stories were written in the Middle Ages. Some of them concerned islands over the sea, and of which I talked about last time, which was all to do with the Merlin story. But mm -hmm. the actual place where Arthur is buried, the Avalon in question there, Avalon simply incidentally means Isle of Apples or Abalac, which was a name given to a number of sacred islands. But mm -hmm. I... Arthur is said to have been buried on an island in the centre of a lake, the same lake in which the, uh, the, the sword Excalibur was thrown. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, is there anywhere in the, in, in the, in the vicinity of Viriconium in the centre of England that could have been a sacred lake to the ancient Celts? Mm -hmm. Well, there were a number of possibilities, but I decided to try and find out where Owen was buried and an old war poem that survives from the 600s tells us that the kings of Paris, kings of that kingdom around that area, Viraconium, were buried at a place called the Churches of Bassa. Mm -hmm. Now, it's incredible, but still today, within about eight miles of this, uh, of this old Roman city, is a village called Bass Church. The churches mm -hmm. of Bassa, Bass Church. I mean, the two things are so similar mm -hmm. that that's got to have been the place they had in mind when they said this is where the kings from Viraconium were buried. What's incredible is just outside this modern village of Bass Church is this that was once a large lake. A lot of it's been drained now for farmland, but it, mm -hmm. and but some parts of these dry parts of this big lake survive as separate lakes and right in the middle was a a hill a hillock which in the limited archaeology that's been done there has shown that it was occupied around 500 and that it was not used as a fortified place it wasn't used for military purposes it was some kind of sacred site uh, there's, there's, there's earthworks around it such as a ringed embankments and ditches but they're not built to be suitable for defensive purposes. So it was, we have what appears to have been a sacred island with a lake mm -hmm. around it uh, up from the period Arthur lived. And this, we're told, is where the kings from Viriconium were buried. The first thing that you mentioned was about the search for the for Excalibur. Um, Obviously, they, they, when I say there's a hill in the middle, it's quite a big hill. It's not a man-made thing. It's huge. I mean, how to, you know, it'd be pretty difficult to look around the whole thing to try and find out where King Arthur might be buried. But somebody suggested, why don't you try and see if Excalibur or other items such as swords or anything were ever thrown into this, you know, this lake? Well, parts of these lakes still survive. There's one large lake there. And I managed to organise for... A marine, uh, a marine archaeological, a forensic marine archaeological group to mm -hmm. go there with equipment to have. They had a, uh, they had a, a boat with all sorts of sonar and radar and you name it on it, so they could go up and down this pretty large lake and tell what was actually on the bottom. And they mm -hmm. came up with some pretty interesting readings. The most interesting of which seems to have been an object that could have been a sword and part of this lake. And we were mm -hmm. so kind of excited about this that they then got the divers to go down, 
But when the divers came back, they said, I'm really sorry, but it's just too murky down there. It's just too peat stained water to mm. actually to see to see anything and besides which on top of the actual bed of the lake there's about four foot of silt and mud mm. until there's much better kind of means of detecting what's down there so we know exactly where to sort you know to, to dig mm-hmm. uh, the only thing we could do is dredge the entire lake and that's just exorbitantly expensive <laughs> so we yeah. kind of we ended up in a situation where we think we know where Excalibur is mm but no mm-hmm. one's going to get to it. Yeah, it's too far, too far to go. Um, got another question from Ceiling Cat. Um, she says, does the Arthurian legend begin the legend of Sacred King's lineage as described in the Golden Bough? I have no idea. <laughs> I, I've never, a, I've never read the Golden Bow, and B, I'm not really sure what king lineage means, sacred lineage. Sa- that's sacred with, kings, yeah. Sacred king. It's all to do with yeah. the Holy Blood, Holy Grail type thing. I'm terribly yeah. sorry, but I shall be very honest when you, with you. When I don't know something, I shall tell you. But Yay. what I do, but <laughs> King Arthur, the interesting thing about his lineage, and this is slightly a different answer to the question, but one mm. thing I did find out is that. The story about King Arthur is that it is said that um, the, 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 the legend is that where he's buried, there is a stone that says, here lies King Arthur, the once and future king. And the, mm-hmm. and the reason behind that legend is it's said that one day na- that he, he will arise from the dead and rule Britain again. Well, that wasn't the original story in the legends of King Arthur. The very earliest versions of it say that one day one of his descendants will again rule Britain. Now, that was really interesting because I managed to trace through these various genealogies that King Arthur, uh, the, the Owen, had an actual had a son called Cuniglasus who had a son. I mean, and I was able, after a, a lot of time and translation was able to make a complete family tree of the direct descendants of king arthur uh, the historical owen owen van Gwyn. and it turned out that his direct descendants in more modern times were the spencer family mm-hmm. one of whom was princess diana mm-hmm. and it's her son william who is second in line to the British throne after Prince Charles. So if when William becomes king, he will in fact have been the first person since the time of King Arthur from that family to rule Britain. And do you know what the really weird thing is? His Mm. middle name is Arthur. Arthur, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Well, So sorry I couldn't answer the proper question there, but try me on another. that's, That's a good answer. I um, want to talk a little bit about the birth in Shropshire because that's where you believe the tomb to be, correct? That's right. In the middle, remember I said that there was this lake and we yes. we were able to do the marine archaeology there. Mm-hmm. The island right in the middle of this hillock is known locally as the birth. It's, uh, it comes from a Welsh word, I believe, meaning beautiful. Uh, what it was called back in the Middle Ages, who uh, you know, in the Dark Ages, who only knows? It might have mm. been known as Avalon. We don't know. Yeah. But this is the place where it seems, according to this, the ancient sources, that the kings from Viraconium were buried. Now, cutting a long story short from this, we worked out exactly the location myself, plus the help of some local archaeologists, mm. were able to work out the location it seemed that Owen Van Gwyn himself was buried. Now, if he's the real Arthur, in other words, we'd figured out the location where this man was buried. Mm-hmm. It was in a roughly acre area of land surrounded by some uh, earthworks, in other words, some uh, a ring of... Uh, a, a ring of uh, a, a couple, but basically, it's a bit difficult to ex- describe what it's like, <laughs> but it's an acre field. Okay, And that acre field was what we needed to examine. Now, I managed to organise a geophysics team to get involved. Now, what geophysics is, is using modern technological equipment 
to look under the ground without the need to dig. For example, ground sensing radar that sends radar images under the ground and bounces back and we can see what's down there. Mm -hmm. And it can also tell where the ground has been disturbed in the past, holes have been dug and then filled in again because of the soil change. And for a whole day, a geophysics team consisting of, 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 of archaeologists using various different types of equipment managed to find that right in the middle of this acre of land, there was what appeared to be a circular ditch about uh, six feet across and six mm-hmm. feet deep that had been dug many years ago and then filled in again. But it was the only thing anywhere within that acre of land that actually matched the description of a burial. Now, we know from other archaeological sites that burials of high-status individuals at that uh, uh, 1,500 years ago were buried in circular, not square pits, mm. and they were buried about six feet down. And this, what they found in the middle of this acre, was exactly consistent with one of those burials. So, in other words... Where this poem told us Owen was buried, there was a burial ditch absolutely consistent with the period in question. Mm-hmm. But what's most exciting of all is that, they, that we know that at that time, again, from other archaeological finds, that warriors were often buried on their sides with a shield on their arm. And mm-hmm. what they found right in the middle of this pit with the radar and other equipment was that there was a large metal object consistent with the central boss, the central part of a shield. So, in other words, at the place where it tells us that Owen Thangwin, the man who was in history, went, had the real name Arf, who ruled from the most sophisticated place in the country, where the poem says he's buried, there is a burial pit consistent with something of that time and well if that hasn't isn't a case of the nearest thing to finding king arthur's grave that you can do i don't know what is Mm -hmm. now is there i know getting an archaeological dig together is maybe difficult maybe impossible but um is there any way that this can be arranged so it's a possibly get down to the tomb and try and find out the identity of the remains inside? Well, at the time the archaeological survey was undertaken with all this equipment, we had the head archaeologist of the county was involved and they were absolutely fascinated by the find. Now, Mm -hmm. the archaeologists wouldn't stick their neck out and say, oh, we think Graham Phillips has found King Arthur. But they did say that what we have here is the grave of an extremely important Dark Age figure, probably mm-hmm. a king from Viriconi and possibly this area in Thanguin. We mm-hmm. want to dig. Uh, it's private land, but the farmers involved were, were, were happy at that time in order for us to actually have a dig. Mm-hmm. But the problem was it's also a protected monument, which means that uh, there are certain places in this country where uh, are very old where uh, you know where it could be buildings it could be pieces of ground where battles were fought and that mm-hmm. and and they are given as a preservation order slapped upon them on by a government department called english heritage and only when you have english heritage permission can you actually do a dig and at the moment i mean we've been waiting i mean wheels grind and move very slowly in the government departments and we're really at the moment hoping that at any time they will grant permission for a dig and that's where we stand arthur and his sword still lie where they always have done Mm. frustrating in a way but um it's kind of like you're on the edge of your seat waiting to see if that can happen and and what will become of the results once you do um i know It seems like a lot of people's graves are found by mistake, Richard III, Uh, not by mistake, by accident, you know, and and I know that there's a lot of battlegrounds where people are buried and, you know, somebody's fixing their driveway and up pops a a skeleton. But it's, it's frustrating when you think you're right on the edge of something and you have to wait, you know, it has to be very frustrating. 
Well, I've I waited for ages. I've, I've been sitting on this for a little while, and I just thought in the end, if I don't publish now, I mean, it, you know, I mean, it, I, I could die before they allow the, a, a dig to take place. I mean, the reason <laughs> they it's <laughs> I've, that I, the, I, to be quite honest, between you and me and all your listeners. <laughs> The reason I think they are not prepared to give them permission at the moment is they are waiting for me to die because then anyone can sort of get involved and be involved in leading the dig. They don't like an amateur, somebody who's not an academic, um, dis- uh, coming up with a discovery like this. Now, I'm not going to be involved in the archaeology. I'm not expert at archaeology. I can't do it. Just like I got the uh, the experts of scientists involved to do the geophysics and the, archaeolo- the archaeologists were there and present supervising the whole thing. It's them that's going to do it. But the, the, the person who, if they do come up with some, even if it's not me, <laughs> They're not going to like it. So they're waiting for me mm-hmm. to die. That's what I think. <laughs> oh, well, let's hope they wait a very, very long time and not precipitate it in any way. Uh, just just to find that out. Remember, remember I've it's also different. written a book about the Holy Grail in which I claim to have found one. So I, I might never die. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. No, they're, I, they're... I'm slightly joking there. Well, I hope I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all hope that too, but you you just <laughs> never know. But I mean, this is, you know, I mean, this whole thing is absolutely fascinating. And in reading stuff, you know, I'm I'm kind of trying to get to the meat and potatoes of all this. And then I'm reading your book and I get distracted into something else. And, you know, it kind of weaves in and out and it's really kind of fascinating. I mean, I was thinking like when I was reading about um, Glastonbury Abbey and how they supposedly had taken the bodies that they found out in front of King Edward I and Queen Elizabeth and placed it in a black marble tomb, you know, and then it survived for like 400 years or whatever. But then when Henry VIII's rule came about, when he broke ties with Rome and he became the head of the Church of England and he ordered that 800 monasteries be disbanded and in many cases destroyed, then I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, I mean, maybe that wasn't Arthur and Guinevere, but all the historical things that they just kind of ravaged and, and messed up. Um, you know, that took me on a whole nother thing. I mean, how could he have done that? You know, ruining so many beautiful things. And, and a lot of people probably made off with a lot of the goods um, from the monasteries and stuff. So it just, it, it, it reading the book just kind of is fascinating in that um, you kind of, think of it, it takes you to other places not just what we're going for but also other things and i think that's kind of the beauty of this book as well well something that's really weird that's just happened concerning an arthurian relic you may remember from in the book that i i i don't i identify a stone which may have been the stone from which arthur is said to have drawn the sword mm-hmm. uh, the sword in the stone story now in the very earliest versions of the story that stone from which Arthur drew the sword is said to be in St. Paul's Cathedral Churchyard in London. Now, I know I said before that London was overtaken by the Anglo-Saxons, so you wouldn't expect to find Arthur associated with that. But if Arthur is the figure we think he is now, Owen Thanguin, Mm -hmm. then as a young man, London was still in the hands of the Britons. It still was the capital of Britain. It was only after that... As, a, as Arthur grew up after he left his teens, that the Anglo-Saxons overtook uh, what is now London. So the fact is that the idea of the sword in the stone incident, Arthur becomes king by drawing a sword from a stone in St. Paul's Cathedral Churchyard in the middle of London, could fit with a very early version of the story. Mm-hmm. There is a stone that stands, that once, that stood in St. Paul's uh, cathedral churchyard until relatively recently mm-hmm. um, which is a limestone block a few feet wide and a few feet long and a few feet high mm-hmm. that is has which according to the earliest records i found was said to have been that very stone hmm. um, what a, what we have found out historical records show that during the middle ages when a mayor was appointed in london in order to officiate in order to as part of his inauguration swearing in as the as uh, to protect london 
-hmm. he was to take a sword from that stone um so that this idea of somebody having the authority to rule london and a stone that you had to take a sword from or was connected with a sword is certainly absolutely historical now mm -hmm. and the earliest story says that this particular stone is one and the same now that was really there it's it it, it was in Ch st paul's cathedral churchyard until the great fire of london in 1666 it eventually ended up uh, a few hundred yards away stuck in the wall of a of modern buildings and mm. even when i wrote the book when i published the book even when i put my my new website stuff together a few weeks back mm -hmm. that stone had stood behind a grill so that you could just see it on the, behind the grill mm -hmm. in this wall in a niche in this wall for, for for years and years but the moment my book is published they've just moved it <laughs> and because they've decided to knock this building down so the day that my book was the very day that it was published this stone which is known in london as the london stone was taken out of the wall put in a nearby museum where it's now on display and the building's being knocked down and they're going to keep it on display there until there's a new building put up and they're going to put it back in there somewhere but i think it should go back to st paul's cathedral but now my book's out for the first time ever you can see this for the first time for for centuries this stone mm. is on public display and you can actually go up and touch it in the museum isn't that weird wow. yeah absolutely <laughs> weird and you facilitated that in a way. well no it had nothing to do with me well, my book hadn't even come they'd already decided to knock this place down unless of course i'm creating changing history or something well that wouldn't be on you know wouldn't be a horrible thing either if you were um you were speaking our time is really really going away um mm -hmm. um you were speaking about your new website new information and um so while you're working on a new book that people will probably go out and get once it's published um where can people go and find out about all your other books well, my website, which is grahamphillips.net, that's grahamphillips.net. I mean, if you just type in Graham Phillips author, you'll find me. But mm -hmm. my, that's my website. And on the front page is all of my books are there. There's a little picture of each other, a little you know, icon, you just, you know, uh, little image, you just click on that. And there's a good few pages that I've made about every one of the books with plenty of pictures. Uh, and you can learn everything um, and you can find out more about um, the Lost Tomb of King Arthur book and where to get it. Mm -hmm. And all the other lovely books. And um, I'll have you back again to talk about some of the other lovely books as we go down the line. But in the oh, meantime, very kind. thank you. I'm, I'm happy that you're so agreeable because I really love love listening and people in the chat room again are saying bring him back. So, see, I have a good excuse to call you back. Uh, it's always a pleasure having you on. And um, I want to thank everybody for listening in tonight. And as always, everybody, blessed be and merry meet again. Good night. This has been another edition of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. Be sure to tune in next week at the same time for another great guest and more cauldron stirring. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2014. Moonlight Hall by Kevin McLeod. Licensed through Incompetech.com.